As you know, the main thrust of my work is to promote ideas of psychological self-help. And it's for this reason that I'm so pleased to welcome Julia Christina to talk with me today. Julia is a clinical counsellor in Vancouver, where she has a successful clinical practice that helps people daily. But she's also one of the foremost educators on mental health and wellness on YouTube. She has in excess of 196,000 subscribers and therefore regularly reaches many tens of thousands of people with her wisdom, knowledge and unique approach to mental health and wellness. And as if that wasn't enough, she's also a sought after speaker and seminar leader. And because one person can only physically be in one place at a time, Julia has created a suite of online programs to enable those not in Vancouver to benefit from her knowledge. So welcome, Julia. Thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you so much, David, for having me here. It's a, it's a privilege. Yeah, it's lovely to, to actually connect because I'm in England and you're in British Columbia, which is I don't suppose it's the other side of the world, but you know, it's, it's, a well, it's across, across the country and over the pond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interestingly, the distance between the East coast of Canada and the West coast of Canada is greater than yeah. the distance across the sea. Yeah. I know that. Isn't that crazy? I remember learning that, that to get to Europe from, you know, the Eastern Canada takes less time than to get from one end of Canada to the other, which is, it's wild. It's a big, it's a big country. Anyway. Thank you for joining me. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you got into this work, how you became a, you know, a person interested in psychology and clinical work, et cetera? Well, it's, it's a little bit of an awkward story and it was only because of my own, I was going to say my own ego <laughs> that got me into the work. And just the, the, the long and short of it is I always kind of knew I wanted to do this work. Um, but I didn't have the guts to go back to school after doing my undergrad degree and sort of, you know, skipping classes and playing cards in the cafeteria and hanging out with friends and not yeah. being super interested. Like I did fine at school, but it wasn't really interested. So the thought of going back and doing a master's degree and having to go back for another two years just felt terrible. And but I was like, how? So I so I dabbled around and I got certificates in these different kind of random things. Like I'm a trained ESL teacher. I'm a certified doula. Um, I'm, I'm just sort of get trying to find the shortcut <laughs> um, to getting to do something that I loved, and just ended up spending a bunch of time doing that. And then it was one day, um, I was at my cousin's wedding. And I was sitting at a table with relatives from the other side of the family, his aunt and uncle from the other side. And I, I knew their children because I'd grown up, you know, every once in a while in the summer being with their kids. And one of their daughters, um, I'm not going to use her real name, but it's called her Sarah Jones. And, you know, I remember her being this kind of curly haired, kind of whiny, a little bit bratty, would follow me and my cousin Dagan around often. And uh, we didn't really like, oh, Sarah, like, leave us alone. Like, she was just obnoxious. And I remember sitting at this table with her parents, Sarah's parents, and we're all grown ups now. And so I asked them, you know, where's Sarah? I see she's not at the wedding. How's she doing? And they're like, oh, Sarah is in school to become a chiropractor. And I was like, well, no, she isn't. And she, I'm not going to let little Sarah Jones go off and be a chiropractor while I sit here and feel sorry for myself about not thinking I can go to be a therapist. Like, that's it. And it was like this moment where I was like, if she can do something like this, then why can't I? And it was just like this bizarre moment where all of a sudden I just had, like, I pulled on my big girl pants and I was like, come on, Julia, you got, you've got something you want to do, get over yourself and let's get in there. And then, you know, I made the decision that day and then bam, six years later, <laughs> I became a therapist. A short six years. A short six years in a program that's only supposed to take two, but it was this whole journey of taking prerequisite courses and upgrading courses because, of course, I played cards in the cafeteria for most of my undergrad degree and didn't go to class. Mm -hmm. And and then it was applying to grad school and I got, you know, declined three times before I actually got in and but. Yeah, and then I, and then it was the ironic part is that as soon as I got into grad school, I just felt complete and I was like this is it and it just felt like I could exhale and I ran and I was this girl who didn't think she was a school person ended up graduating top of her class and valedictorian 
And I was like, it's, and it's not because I'm like the brightest person in the world. It's because when you find that fit, right? Like when you find that thing where like, this is just feels like an extension of me. It doesn't even feel like work. It just feels like I got to learn and I got to, I got to be, I've got to get this. I've got to become great at this because I want to understand this and be able to share this. So you, you found your passion. I guess so, right? And it's lucky, like not everyone gets to find a passion for work, right? Some of us find passions in a hobby or in a sport or in some kind of creative endeavor. Mm. I just happen to find it in my work, which, you know, is kind of cool. I think it's fantastic. I hear you. I, you know, I, I, uh, this is my passion as well. So, you know, it's nice to it's nice to just spend your time doing the stuff that you're really interested in. It's fabulous, isn't yes. it? It's a great way to spend time. And also being a bit helpful right and also <laughs> you know helping to make the world a better place yeah, yeah one human you know one healed human brain at a time now i i you, you like me i know that you <clears throat> you work with people who have what we might call mental health problems and i note on some of the literature that you've written that you're, you're kind of on a mission to normalize mental health and wellness you know to and, I mean, and from my point of view, I say, like, just consider it a problem to solve, right? Yeah. What do you see as ba- barriers? What's, what, what hampers people from actually just going, you know what? I have a problem. I'd like some help with it. What should we do? What's what barriers? What, ham- what hampers people? Do? Yeah, and I think it's starting to change now as we're normalizing the fact, like, just like we all have a human body, we all have a human brain. Yeah. Right? And our bodies don't all of a sudden just aren't just like healthy on their own, just like our brains aren't all of a sudden just healthy on their own. And so if we want to be creating physical health, we have to do something about it. We have to use our body. We have to exercise. We have to build those muscles, right? We have to invest in that. It's the same thing with our brain. If we want a healthy brain, we'd be exercising those muscles. We have to be building that mental strength. And I think we're starting to normalize it, but I think I think for a lot of people, they think that in order to see a therapist, in order to actually work on myself, there has to be like something that's completely debilitating, right? Like it's not a problem until it's like this major barrier problem where I'm having trouble getting out of bed or, you know, I'm having, you know, these major panic attacks that, uh, you know, without, without any warning or, you know, like I feel completely disconnected from my life and right. Like we, we wait, it's like, it's like, you probably know with like marriage counseling that what's the stats on marriage counseling that like, it's like about a 50% success rate of marriage counseling, because by the time people actually go, the problems are so bad. It's almost like the point of no return. Yeah. And absolutely that's not the case with our own individual self. I don't yeah. think we ever get to a point where we're at the point of no return, but we often wait till it's so bad yeah. It's like, I'm the last thing. My mental well-being is the last thing on my list. Because like, oh, it'll just get better. And then 20 years later, it hasn't. It's the old process of avoidance. It works well for quite a lot of things. It doesn't work quite so well <laughs> for mental health problems often. And I agree right. with you. People leave it until it's actually, you know, it's, it's catastrophically bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing things the same way I've always done them, keep thinking about things the same way I've always thought about them, keep handling my problems the same way I've, I've always handled them, and hope that like one day it'll just magically get better. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We, would, we wouldn't do that with our bodies. We're like, I'm just going to like sit here and eat Cheetos, Doritos, and Ding Dongs all day on the couch and you know watch Netflix all day. Yeah. I'm just going to hope that my body is just going to, you know, I'm just going to get a six pack. <laughs> I know, but it's like, it's like there's, a, <clears throat> there's a different logic at work because as you say, if I eat unhealthy food all day long, I'll probably be unhealthy. If I don't exercise, right, I, I will probably have a problem. I and mean, everyone gets that. Yeah. But there's something about mental health problems that, you know, because they're, they're shameful, we can't talk about them. Yeah. People do not think of mental health problems in the same way. as yeah. the, and, and potentially, I wonder if it's because they're kind of, um, what would be the word, hypothetical, metaphorical. Yes. They're not, they're intangible. Yes. You well, can... and I mean, and it's, and it's social stigma, David, it's social stigma. Men have been socialized or people socialized as men have yeah. been taught that the only emotions that they're allowed to feel is anger and <laughs> like a level of happiness. That's not too happy, right? You don't want to be too excited. Mm-hmm. You don't, your smile doesn't want to get too big. And those are the emotions that are 
that men are allowed to feel. Men have been socialized with this way. They're not allowed to feel sad. They're not allowed to feel hurt. They're not allowed to feel lonely. They're not allowed to feel shame. Like those are, you're not allowed to feel those things. And so then of course there's going to be a stigma. And women historically, when women have shown emotion, they have been called hysterical, mm. right? The hysterical, out of control, crazy woman. Yeah. And so of course we're ashamed of our emotions and we're like, oh, if I'm ever feeling anything other than this sort of like middle of the row, not too happy, not too sad mm -hmm. kind of like level of contentment. If I'm feeling anything other than that, then there's something wrong with me or I'm doing something wrong mm -hmm. or, you know, there's, I can't talk about this because I'm going to be failing compared to every other human who has it all figured out right? Who's able to kind of ride this middle line. And so it's like, I'm, we are living in a culture that has created a stigma around emotions, human emotions. I, I, I agree with you. I think I agree with you entirely, but I, from, now here's the question, from my point of view in Britain, I think it's getting worse. The, okay. uh, there was a statistic published um, two weeks ago, 6.6 .6 million National Health Service patients were surveyed over a number of years, between 2008 and 2018. And women, or, or women and girls between 18 and 24 had had a threefold increase in anxiety to 30% of that population. Now the sample's huge, 6.6 .6 million, right? Yeah, yeah. And we go, and that's since 2008. And, this, and yeah. you know the, the rise is similar to men, but not not so high because men are typically lower on the statistics. And I I just wonder, do you think that like mental illness and happiness, dissatisfaction, do you think they're increasing, or do you, is that from your point of view, or is it just a British perspective? You know, we're we just miserable over I here now. I don't know. I don't know, right? Like, I don't know if it is. It's a really tough thing to to quantify because we didn't understand it before, right? It's like we didn't have the word depressed, you know, 30, 40 years ago or like anxiety. Like you'd be like, oh, I'm feeling anxious right now. But it wasn't like I'm struggling with an, you know, with yeah. significant anxiety. Right. Like there's there's mental illness in my family history that's looking at it now or like, OK, like wow. there may have been some bipolar going on there. But it wasn't diagnosed because there wasn't the understanding around it. No. No. Right. Like I think. You know, and it is one of those tough things where you're like, is this all of a sudden just happening more? Or are we just like talking about it more? Are we yeah. understanding it more? Yeah. Um, you know, human suffering has been present since the beginning of time. You know, you look at this, you even just look at the Stoics and the early philosophers and, you know, trying to kind of understand the human psyche and talking about, you know, fears of, of being judged. And um, who was it? Uh, was it? Uh, one of the Stoics, I can't remember his name right now, oh, but really you know, was it that talked about this practice of like paint of wearing like colorful clothing out in the streets, oh. like as this like shame attacking exercise to be oh. like, you know, like do this very like bold thing and to like to see that, you know, people might judge you or like say things about you, but it's not going to kill you and there's actually no harm. Like it's this. Yeah. Right, these fears of being of being singled out, of being judged, of being alienated and ostracized, yeah. have existed since yeah, the beginning of time. Yeah, it did. And I guess since mental illness has been um, on the radar, it's typically been highly medicated. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. I have Absolutely. A, I don't know if you follow soccer. I mean, I don't really follow soccer, but there's a, the national stadium in London is called the Wembley Stadium. Okay. And it holds 90,000 people. And when it's full of 90,000 people, 15,000 of those are on an antidepressant. That's the proportion of the British yeah. population. Isn't that? I mean, I go, and I go that's like, it's mind blowing. And you don't, like, you don't care. You know, it's like, it's, it's a national scandal. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, I'm not anti-psychopharmaceuticals. I think there's a time and place, but it's yeah. not everywhere and it's not all the time, right? It's, it's not, not like, oh, I just got, I just, you know, broke, got, you know, just went through a breakup or having a job transition and yeah. I'm finding this really challenging. Now I need to take medication, right? Like I think <laughs> learning how to, and that's what I teach a lot is how to process your emotions, how to be with your emotions, yeah. right? We don't have to hide from our emotions. And the goal is, we don't come become complete beings by only feeling half our feelings. 
No. Right? Something hasn't gone terribly wrong if you're feeling sad at the end of a relationship. You know, something hasn't gone terribly wrong if you're feeling anxious mm. when you're starting a new job. Mm. Like this is normal. This is yeah. normal. These are called, this is called the human experience. And I think so often, even just allowing ourselves to normalize human emotions, t- it takes away a lot of the suffering because it's that compound effect, right? Like I'm having this feeling, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling scared, I'm feeling lonely. Oh my gosh, why am I feeling this way? I just got to get over it. This is too hard. I can't handle it. You know, like, let's get rid of this. I can't feel this. And then that becomes, you know, this compounding, all this anxiety around our anxiety, yeah. creates this like big thing that we get crushed under where the emotion and experience in and of itself is often not as bad as we think, right? Like just allowing ourselves to feel a feeling and process a feeling without all of the evaluation and judgment around it. What some people call dirty thoughts, you know, the interpretation of the emotion. Yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, so I mean... It's, it is, it's, it's an interesting time that we're at. I don't know what the stats are in Canada for medication. I think it tends to be a little bit lower, um, but I don't actually have, you know. Yeah, well, it's just one of my. um, But I think it also too, David, like in all honesty, part of the medication thing is because often services, the government doesn't cover it, right? The government still doesn't really acknowledge mental health as an important thing. So people are paying out of pocket for therapy. They're like, I could get my pills covered with my, you know, medical yeah. coverage, yeah. or I could pay out of pocket to go to therapy. Yeah, yeah, no, right. I, I, yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, well, we have therapy, we have a therapy service, a national therapy service here. Okay. Um, but, but actually what happens is that um, only about 24% of people who start actually end up, you know, in a, in a sort of a cured state. So I don't yeah. call that fantastic, but anyway, that's that's yeah. that's a different kind of thing. But you are a pioneer in in bringing sort of useful psychological insight to many thousands of people, and I was just wondering what you know what would what would be like one, two, or th- a couple of things that people would really benefit from knowing from your experience. Mm, emotions are not as terrible as we think they are. I think that's one of the biggest things. I have a membership community and there's like an, I was telling you about, there's like an eight um, lesson core teaching in there where I just really teach people how to manage their minds and emotions in a very succinct step-by-step process. And the first lesson is about learning how to process an emotion, how to just be with your feelings, right? Like an emotion is a sensation in your body. That's it. Yeah. It's it. You know, anxiety is you know, maybe a tightness in the chest, maybe like a flipping feeling in the stomach, right? Maybe, you know, like some tingling in the armpits or like a, just sort of like a, like a, like a tight feeling in the head. That's all that anxiety is. And we're like, oh, it's so, and you know, and we know too in psychology that the line between the physiological response of anxiety and excitement is next to none. And it's only our evaluation of the sensation that gets us into a tizzy. Yeah. The right? Like, oh my gosh, I'm feeling so anxious. This is so awful versus, oh my gosh, I'm feeling so excited. This is so wonderful. I find though that people, um, you know, what you focus your attention on, you get more of. <clears throat> so as you say, you know, people get, let's say a physical sensation and they focus their attention on it and it magnifies. And then it becomes like overwhelmed, like a volcano about the pop, you know, panic attack. Yeah. You know, and as you say, yeah. if you actually went, if much earlier on you realize that feelings are not facts, it's just yes. a feeling. Yeah, you, you know, it comes from a thought, right? Yeah, you don't have to go. There to is the, no, um, there is no emotion without thought. No, I agree. Without cognition, without interpretation, without meaning making, there's no emotion. Yeah. And so, just really understanding, like we just sort of like in this sort of like you know bird's eye view, let's break it right down. An emotion is a sensation in your body that's created by a sentence in your brain. Right. A way of interpreting something, a way of seeing something and understanding something. And of course, there's more to it. Right. Because we have these filters that we understand the world around us from our own shame, from our own pain, from our own experiences, for our own you know, feelings of whether or not we're good enough or lovable enough or worthy enough or significant enough. Right. All of this stuff we comes in and sort of clouds our perspective. And yeah. that's the work. Right. That's the work yeah. is to uncloud that. The baggage right? is linked to the process. 
Um, yeah. Past experiences, beliefs, interpretation, yeah. habits of thought, automatic yeah, that, habits of thought. You know, that confirmation filter where I'm just going to see things that are going, my, I'm going to filter in information in my environment that's going to confirm. Yeah. The, the things that I already struggle with, right? My own, that's all, are often going to confirm my shame. Yeah. Like, I'm not good enough. No one loves me. People don't care about me. I don't have what it takes. I, you know, mm. yeah. all of that stuff. And so we filter information through that and then we feel terrible. So let me ask you then. Um, you talk about emotional processing and of course, being able to do something with an emotion is quite interesting and quite useful, you know, um, <clears throat> In, in a, pre a previous incarnation, I was a, a PTSD. Well, I am a, still a PTSD therapist, but I was in the National Health Service doing it, right? Okay. So, what would what, what do you find is a useful way of processing an emotion, or or maybe a negative memory, or a persistent thought? I mean, what would be an intervention, like something that you might do that would be helpful? And it's going to sound really simple, and it's going to sound too simple, um, and it does take some work to like actually. <laughs> cut through your brain's objections, right? But just like when, it, when an invasive thought shows up, it's a thought, right? Like really being able to, and it sounds so simple and you're kind of like, huh? But like when you're really just like, this is just a string of words going through my brain that my brain is making some kind of meaning out of. That's what's creating my distress right now mm. is, is a thought. Right. Like it's 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 my brain having understood or made sense of an experience from the past that I'm no longer experiencing now. And my brain is bringing it up and it's creating this experience of this emotional experience. And, you know, of course, then our brains. Right. If this is new work, our brains are going to object to that and be like, no, 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 no. It's this and this and this. And like, you know, like this is so awful. And what you did or what happened or what you went through is so awful. And, you know, like it's you got to like you got to feel terrible about it right now. And it's OK. Like we want to feel terrible. And that's the thing about emotions. We're allowed to feel terrible if we're like, you know, what? I really want to feel terrible about this because it was a really hard thing. It was a really painful thing. Right. And to be able to say, like, I just want to experience this this emotion right now and to acknowledge that pain right now and that's okay too mm -hmm. but you know just really recognizing that my emotion is being created right now from words in my brain that are going through my brain mm -hmm. and so processing that emotion just becomes this, this experience of, of observation what's, what's going favorite? on in my body right now what's your favorite image or metaphor just to convey that to someone I've heard of leaves on a stream. My, my, my favorite is let the worry fly by. Observe it yeah. fly by. I like thoughts on a cloud. Like I do a meditation. I have a free meditation where I just like to notice the sentence in your brain is as you're kind of watching the clouds float by the sky, put each word from that sentence on each cloud and just sort of watch it pass through your field of vision. Yeah, yeah. And I really just, you know, <laughs> like that that metaphor yeah I, I definitely would say though that you've got to catch that early you know it's better to do that earlier in the process rather than later in the process yeah and it's work right like it takes work and it's like going to yeah. the gym right you got to exercise your brain you got to train your brain to be able to kind of cut through the noise right because yeah. our brain is going to want to try to convince us to to stay in our current state Right, yeah. to stay in the struggle and it's only because it's familiar and like for a lot of us we don't know what it's like to not be struggling we don't know what it's like to not feel anxious to not feel depressed to not feel overwhelmed to not feel stressed and we become so like consumed with this that our brain will literally literally try to hold on to it because it's like no, no no don't don't eat, don't do anything different because we don't know what's going to happen in different and different could be dangerous because it's unknown and there's always the risk of danger in the unknown so just yeah. understanding that our like self-protective brain is trying to keep the status quo because as uncomfortable as it is it's, it's working because we're alive and our brain's job is to keep us alive and to reproduce, to keep the human race going. And so for this part of it, it's keeping you alive. And if you're alive right now in your current state of suffering, then your brain is like, we're doing an okay job. So don't try and do anything else. Right. Like in this, and we see this a lot, like I see the last with students that they'll kind of hit this wall yeah. and they'll be like, oh my gosh, like everything was going great. Now all of a sudden, like, I'm, I feel like I'm falling backwards and it's just your brain you know, it's like, it's your brain is just like, nope, nope, nope. We don't know what's going on. This is uncharted territory. 
stay back. Like all of these thoughts about you not being good enough, you not being lovable, you know, you being like crazy and out of control or like, uh, you know, broken, like, let's just bring those back in. Cause we know what, we know what happens when that's there. I find though, I find that um, one of the biggest problems I find that people have is that they believe their inner critical voice. Yes. You know, people believe the negative things they tell themselves because oh, yeah. they've been telling themselves it for 20, 30 oh. years. And the truth is they're not even our own self It's not even our own words. No, and that's most, the crazy part. These well, are not my thoughts. These are somebody else's thoughts. Yeah. This is my society's, you know, thoughts. This is my parents' thoughts. This was my coach's thoughts. These were their thoughts that yeah. I just allowed myself to believe. My brain just is like, well, that sounds like an interesting idea. Let's just believe that. Well, they're older. They're wiser. It must be true. Right. And at a young, impressionable age, we don't know that it's like grownups are just older people. (laughs) (laughs) They don't know everything. They don't have it all figured out. Their opinion doesn't isn't carry this like divine, you know, all knowing wisdom. They're human beings who are dealing with their own stuff and projecting that stuff onto everyone around them, like all human beings are. And then we've just sort of blindly absorbed somebody else's thoughts as our own. And we're just like, well, I'm just going to I guess I better just keep believing them. I guess, though, as kids, we have to believe our parents are telling us the truth. Otherwise, it would be a man, yeah. wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it's survival instinct, right? The child ego yeah. has to, you know, in order to survive, we have to believe our parents because we can't reject our parents because we can't survive on our own. So it's like this ingrained sort of quality that a child will think that a parent is right. And if it's something is wrong, it's my fault. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. And then I can't blame my parent. Oh. I cannot blame my parent because then I might I'm faced with the dilemma of rejecting my parent. And if I reject my parent, I'm off on my own and I can't survive on my own. So I just have to assume that if my parent says that I, you know, there's something wrong with me, that there's something wrong with me or that it's my fault, then it's my fault. Yeah. That's why we have therapy. That's why we have therapy and just, but really just challenging that idea that because, you know, a belief is just a thought we've thought so long that we've just sort of agreed it must be true just because it's been around for a long time. And it, right? it, it's like a squatter. It's like this person like comes into a house and they're like squatting in the house and like, you've been squatting here for like 20 years. I guess you must live here, but yeah. they never did. It was never their home and they never lived there, but we're just like, well, you've been here for a long time. So you, you know, must be for a reason. No, it's just cause they just like, we're like, yeah, this feels, this just, this works for me. I'm just going to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you think of like <clears throat> the last hundred years of the development of, of psychological therapy say, since Freud or whatever, there's a lot of really complicated stuff, you know, yeah. and particularly when you go down the psychodynamic route, really complicated stuff. But actually, it's just a thought, and it doesn't necessarily belong to me, and I didn't necessarily create it. It's just got stuck, and it's yeah. not necessarily true. I mean, that sort of simplifies it down about as simple as it can get, doesn't it? Yeah. But if people actually took that on board, how would things be different? Be be a big change. We, I know. And that's the hard part where it's like, okay, then I, you know, then I'm faced with the responsibility of being like, this is my life and I'm responsible for what happens with it. Yeah. Right. This is my human experience that I get, you know, as far as you know, one shot at. <laughs> and I, you know, and that's the thing. Right. And I think that that's the thing that we forget to take seriously is like, we get one go and the things that are more often than not that are preventing us from having a more rich and fulfilling fulfilling life it's is it's, it's just fear like it's thoughts yeah. it's a yeah. perception of being judged of being cr- criticized of you know and the truth is as well is that we don't actually fear other people's criticism like let's be honest we think we fear other people's judgment oh, we yeah. think we fear criticism it's not about what they're saying. It's about what we're going to make it mean. And it's our own, it's our own stuff that they're hitting. Right. Yeah. So I wrote in a critical voice projected outwards and then, then bounce back. So in fact, yeah. you know, nobody else can I have a motto, which is kind of fun, right? You're a star in your own movie, but you're an extra to everybody else. Yeah. And actually nobody really cares, you know? So I mean, social anxiety, people really don't care that much. <laughs> right. Yeah. And remember, if, if you walk in a room and everyone's sort of feeling like uncomfortable and insecure about like how they're showing up and what people are perceiving them and you know like whether or not they look silly like if everyone is thinking that then who has all this time to be standing around doing all the judging yeah but if you stare at people to see if they're looking at you they will look back at you <laughs> which i find is a <laughs> yeah um all right look you do but you you have two hats you probably have at least two hats probably have many more than two hats but you do therapy and you do coaching mm-hmm. 
Mm. Do, you, do you think there's actually a difference between those two? Not in the way I work. Yeah. I think there is for some people. Um, you know, and you know, to fully frank, I find that there is a lot of gaps in the way traditional therapy is done because we know that, like, and I've had a lot of people say this, like, I went to the therapist and I know where my problems come from, right? I know really well, like I totally get, you yeah. know, the neglect, the the criticism, the abuse. Like, I get it. I know where my problems come from. I can see it. But like, now what? <laughs> Yeah, what do I do with it? How do I? How right. do I work and it? you know, it's that saying that the absence, and, and even still, right? Like even still, well, maybe I won't go into that because that's sort of taking us down another rabbit hole. But you know, therapy is can be helpful. It can be cathartic to have that understanding and that insight. Mm. But then, how do I turn that into constructive action? And I think that that's where coaching. You know, uh, I think therapy is lacking in the implementation. Okay. Right in in the um, traditional therapy is lacking in the follow through. So like now, what do I do? And coaching is lacking in the depth. So coaching is often about changing habits. Yeah. Okay. Right. And 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 therapy is often about understanding pain. And so they're both, I think, incomplete in a way traditionally. And of course, there are coaches who go deeper, and there are therapists who um, teach implementation and and action. Yeah. Um, but I think they do have to go hand in hand. That's my experience with it. And so the way that I work, I, you know, typically call myself a therapeutic coach where I'm like, we're going to do the, like, we're going to do the, the deeper work and we're going to do the healing. And we're going to do the understanding. And then we are going to do something with that, right? Like we're going to heal the pain. And then we're going to, we're going to move forward. We're going to start making changes and we're going to start maintaining, right? Like start uh, getting to this next, you know, healthier healed place. And then we're going to learn how to, how to maintain that yeah. and how to handle it when, yeah. when life kicks our asses. Yeah, so it's the whole thing. Find the problem, in a sense, resolve the problem, practice the solution. Yeah. I mean, we know that, and I remember hearing that saying, that the absence of pain is not pleasure. No. Right? Like, not feeling terrible doesn't all of a sudden result in happiness. That happiness is created. Yeah. And I, and I said this the other day in a session. I said, happiness is not a destination. It's a journey. It's a discipline. Oh, I It's a I discipline. Yeah, okay. I say it's a journey. Yeah. <laughs> we don't get to happiness. We are we have to be disciplined in our happiness. Yeah. And that comes through being present and intentionally noticing what's yeah. happening right now. Where's the joy right now? Where's the connection right now? Where's the life that I'm living right now? Like what's what is my what am I doing to be connected to to life and everything that's happening around me right now? And that takes a discipline of the brain because our brain wants to go to anticipating the future and you know ruminating about the past. So we actually have to get in there and discipline our brain to be like, let's be present and connected to the joy now. It's the moment, yeah. Yeah. Because it's the only moment you have to be alive. It's the only moment that you can do anything. In the wise words <laughs> of Kung Fu Panda, the past is history, the future a mystery. Today is a gift. That is why it's called the present. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, this is it. This is the only time we can actually live is in the present. We can't live in the past and we can't live in the future. Yeah. We can only live in the present. And so our experience of joy is created. And then, you know, to be honest, like we can create joy in anticipating the future. I mean, our thoughts create our joy and that can be, you know, completely about, you know, anticipating or being excited about something in the future, oh. but really allowing ourselves to, to be disciplined in the present moment, what's happening right now. Super. Now, I guess because of COVID, you're you know you're doing Zoom calls with people from all over the world in a sense. But I'm interested. Yeah. I'm just interested in a, in a way because in my in my view, you know, this I mean, COVID's brought things into relief, right? It's a different way of doing things. We're doing yeah. therapy online, whereas previously we'd have to be in our office. Um, and you, but you do online courses, and you know, you've got a number of online courses. Some are larger, some are smaller, and I do online courses as well. And I was just wondering. Do you find that do you find that the online courses, which are potentially a new way of a new way of doing things, because you can reach unlimited numbers of people, do you find that they're an effective clinical solution, right? Do they work? Yeah. I have an intensive <laughs> course. <laughs> yeah, I have an intensive course on boundaries. Right. Um, that it and it sells like hotcakes. 
<laughs> as, people, as soon as people start to understand that they're, you know, so much of their frustration and their overwhelm and their people pleasing and their codependence and, you know, all, a lot of their relationship problems and just feeling, you know, kind of like their own lack of sense of self of their own kind of identity and co- feeling comfortable and confident in who they are. So much of that is rooted in boundary issues right? And being taught, basically taught to not have boundaries and to be emotionally fused to other human beings, which is just becomes this whole other mess. Um, and so learning boundaries. And, you know, I know that I've seen other kind of little, like quick little, you know, 30 minute classes on boundaries. This one, mine is like a five hour deep dive because it's really goes, you know, it does that deeper work and it really helps you to understand what's going on and how to undo that and then redo it, like redo your thoughts and behaviors um, and emotions around boundaries and how you're showing up and how you're feeling about yourself. And then just like kind of un- untangling all of that stuff and then kind of re-spooling into a, into a, uh, uh, just a more um, efficient, <laughs> right. Just a more effective, clean, experience right. but before we were before we came on air in a sense before we recorded this <coughs> we yeah. had a conversation about your new course the shift society and it seems to me that that is also a place where you're kind of retraining and refining yeah. boundaries yeah. and can you just tell us a little bit more about that yeah so my boundaries course is a self-study do on your own workbook you know lessons pre-recorded do it all do this deep work on your own and and i get emails all the time from people being like oh my gosh, I didn't understand this. And now I get it. And it's been like kind of a game changer. Um, but then in the shift society, that is an ongoing, it's a membership community where you pay monthly to be a part of it and you get tools and you get teachings. And, you know, there's, I do like have a whole series, uh, masterclass series in the membership um, that's recorded on, on healthy boundaries and people pleasing. And so then in that way, then you get the ongoing support. Cause a lot of people, you know, um, want to feel connected, want to feel accountable, right? Like we're like, I don't really want to do it on my own. I know for me, I'm part of a membership group because I'm just like, I don't want another self-study course. Some people love that because like, no, I just want to do my own thing, you know, get it done. But then for me, for a lot of us, I think, especially in this, you know, global pandemic, we are so much more disconnected. We don't have those, you know, normal micro connections that we get regularly by going to the coffee shop or, you know, being able to like pass them on the street without like... <laughs> <laughs> trying to like get a, you know keep that distance yeah. between you two and so just having more of that connection and accountability so yeah, I um, do the community I think that what you're doing with the ship society is fantastic because I do wonder you know like mental health problems there's probably a, just over a billion people in the world with mental health problems mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. And there are you know I mean there's plenty of therapists in Canada and America and England but but in principle, there's, you'll never solve that problem with therapists because the, su- the, the supply of clients or the, the number of people suffering is way in excess, right? So we have to yeah. find a, a different way of doing it to allow people to access in a relatively yeah. cost-effective way the tools, the understandings, the things that they need. And it seems to me that your shift society, you know, is sort of probably on the button. Yeah, it seems to be, right? Like, and it's... And, you know, just dialing in and really figuring out over years of doing this work and, you know, and working in different like courses and group, group coaching programs and just really figuring out like, what are the kind of, what are the, what are the, the basic tools that are going to create the biggest impact? Yeah, that's super. Well, I hope that goes well. I noticed it's, um, I think membership's closed right now, isn't it? We are, well, we are open right now. We are just about to close. Oh, okay. So if anyone wants to get into the, or at least apply or start the process, now the better be quick. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, that, I mean, that's fascinating. And as I said earlier on, Julia, I think you know you're you're really pushing the boundaries of of like what's possible, and which is fascinating and interesting. And you know, you're helping more and more people as your, you know, as your message goes out there. You're you're actually allowing people to go. Actually, hang on maybe I don't need to struggle with this after all. Yeah. Yeah. After 30 years, perhaps I can do something a bit different. Yeah. And we all think that, right. I remember Tim Ferriss. Um, he's a pretty well-known author. He wrote the, the four hour work week and the four hour body. And I, yeah. he's got a fantastic podcast. I remember even him talking about it and being like, you know, I just always thought that like, 
other people could like get through their issues and find that kind of mental peace. But there was just something in my wiring that, you know, it's not possible for me. And, you know, I remember feeling that way. Mm. I remember feeling like there's something in my wiring mm. that's like different, that it's not going to allow me to, to find that place of, of center of like feeling, you know, still being a human being with ups and downs and all arounds, right? Like we all are, but also just being like, oh, actually, no, there's not something wrong with me. I just wasn't learning the right things, right? Yeah, the, 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 the curious thing is the simple fact that we're all different, just yeah. just different, is potentially sufficient, you know, because I'm different, therefore I am wrong. No, no, it's just different. Everyone's different. Just different. <laughs> just different. Yeah. Just different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so how can people find you? If people want to connect with you, um, perhaps get inside the shift society or, or do something else. How can people find you, Julia? Yeah. So there is on my website, probably the easiest way. It's just juliachristina.com, Christina yeah. with a K. And uh, on there, I have a list. There's a, a tab with all my courses and then um, like a place to, you know, get into the shift society or get on the wait list for the shift society, depending on um, when you have it to land on my page and be listening to this. To this and I'll um, make sure that that. Talk. I'll make sure that that's on the description of the video, et cetera. Yeah. And that's probably the easiest way. And it has a link yeah. to, I think there's a link to my, my YouTube channel and my Instagram and I'm, I'm active on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So. Yeah. Well, it should be easy to find you on YouTube. Okay. Is it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're huge. In a, in a nice way. <laughs> yeah, I know. Lovely. All right. Um, I've taken up enough of your time and, um, Thank you so much, David. It's been a delightful having a conversation with you. It's really been interesting and insightful. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Anytime. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Bye bye.